Good afternoon. Uh, on behalf of the expert committee on communicable diseases of the SLMA, I wish to welcome all participants who are participating uh, on site as well as online. Uh, the expert committee on communicable diseases is regularly studying the infectious diseases currently uh, uh, they are in uh, internationally as well as locally so uh, in february when we uh, came to know about the who global cholera situation uh, we thought uh, uh, this will be a problem in the future. Now, in March 2023, there was uh, a situation, uh, external situation report by the WHO, uh, which said that uh, it's about 24 countries have uh, having cholera outbreaks and they have uh, estimated it as a, uh, a very high risk. So uh, the expert committee on communicable diseases decided to uh, educate the, the, the local uh, medical personnel and others about uh, the cholera situation. And therefore, we, decide, uh, we decided to uh, 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 organize this symposium. Uh, so for today's symposium on uh, cholera, uh, which says the topic is the world is facing upsurge of uh, cholera pandemic, seventh cholera pandemic, and most uh, uh, most things would be, I think, discussed by Dr. Uh, Ruan Patirana uh, in his uh, first lecture. So uh, we are trying to uh, educate the people in Sri Lanka, the medical personnel, and the others regarding this cholera outbreak. So we have three eminent uh, uh, speakers today. The first speaker is Dr. Tilanga Ruan Patirana, uh, who is an, a consultant epidemiologist from the uh, epi epidom epidemiology unit of the Ministry of Health. He will talk to you about uh, history, current global situation, and steps to prevent cholera in. Sri Lanka again. Over to you, Dr. Ruan Patrana. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to uh, present this uh, topic in this symposia. <clears throat> so my topic uh, for today's talk is history, current uh, gl uh, global situation and steps to prevent cholera in Sri Lanka again. So these are my objectives. Uh, introduction, history of cholera, then uh, global uh, and uh, local situation, then epidemiology and finally I'll discuss what are the steps in place to prevent uh, the entry of cholera to Sri Lanka. So cholera is a Greek word, uh, which means a gutter of a roof. So it says uh, fluids are forcibly expelled from the body resembling a gutter. And uh, it's caused by uh, bacteria, as all of we know, it's uh, Vibrio cholera. There are many serotypes, but outbreaks can cause by O1 and O139. So the original reservoir was uh, supposed to be in the Ganga Delta in uh, India in 19th century. And uh, this is uh, Dr. John Snow. He is uh, considered as the uh, father of 
field epidemiology. Uh, so he started investigation on uh, cholera uh, in the outbreak which sets in uh, in 1854 in uh, UK, London, and uh, and he developed the first ever spot maps. Now these days we have a lot of high tech uh, maps, but uh, he used the uh, the first concepts of the spot maps and still this spot map is available. Now uh, this is very interesting. Now in this, uh, what he did was, he took a map uh, of uh, London city and uh, he tried to um, mark the cholera cases and uh, he noticed this, uh, the pump where near the broad street, you get large number of clustering of cholera patients. So whereas pump C and pump B was not so. So at that time cholera was not, the causative organism was not identified. So then uh, he wrote to the, uh, the sanitary board there and uh, advised the people not to use water from this particular the tap. Uh, and these are some of the posters which are still available on the web, what they have used on those days. Then, uh, since no one is uh, listening to his, uh, you know, instructions, what he suggested next step was, he asked the uh, board to remove the handle of this Broad Street pump. If you go to London still, you can see this uh, pump. Now they called uh, not Broad Street, uh, now it's a Broad Wick Street, but still the pump is there and the handle is preserved in the Museum of London. Right. Cholera was uh, discovered uh, twice. First by Filippo Fassini during an outbreak in Florence, Italy. It's the same year where um, Joan Snow did this epidemiological studies. And uh, on the second time, Robert Koch uh, diagnosed, uh, so discovered the same uh, disease in 1883, exactly 30 to 32 years later on. So up to now, there had been seven cholera pandemics, killed millions uh, in the worldwide. And first six occurred uh, from 1870 to 1923. Now we are on the seventh pandemic, which began in 1961 uh, in Indonesia, and it's still continuing. And it affected uh, most countries and continents than previous six. The global incidence reduced uh, drastically in 1990s bit about uh, history in Sri Lanka. So I found this uh, paper by RM, RM K. Ratnayaka from uh, Department of Geography, University of Sri Javadarpura, Sri Lanka. Now, according to him, there were reports uh, from the uh, Director Quarantine Department uh, from 1841 to 1950. There were uh, reported cases of cholera in Sri Lanka on the right hand side you can see that in the same thing in a tabular form. So now we come to uh, the global situation, the current global situation. I uh, found this on 3rd February uh, WHO website. Uh, this is a bit hazy but uh, when you look at uh, the map, uh, most of the cholera cases and the outbreak have been reported from the, uh, the Asian region and the Sub-Saharan African region, sorry, Sub-Saharan African region. If you uh, enlarge this section a bit, and now you can see the countries, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and on your right hand side, uh, the Bangladesh, and uh, in Africa, uh, the countries like uh, Nigeria and uh, Congo, uh, and uh, Ethiopia. So those are the uh, countries with high number of reported cases. Further on the global situation, uh, since 2017, there has been an increase in cholera cases, uh, but the global burden is largely unknown because this is a disease which is highly underreported. So current estimate is 2.9 million cases and 95,000 deaths annually by WHO. In 2021, 23 countries reported cholera outbreaks, mainly African and uh, East Mediterranean, WHO regions. So again WHO reports this uh, average case fatality rate globally around 2 
and the African continent it's around 3 percent. So this is the, uh, the, the figure which shows the uprise of cholera after 2017. So if you pay your attention here, now you can see the largest rise due to the cases coming from Asian region and uh, again uh, African region as well. So when you go to last year, it's in 2022, 30 countries reported outbreaks. So among them, 14 had not report cholera cases in 2021. So uh, that's one new, new countries to be reported. Further, it included non-endemic countries as well, examples uh, Lebanon and Syria. So now you can see the depth of this uh, transmission. So as at uh, 2023 February, 18 countries continue to report uh, cholera and these are the countries and I have highlighted uh, the countries with highest number of cases. So one common thing for these countries, uh, most of them have fragile health systems, complex humanitarian crisis, uh, then climate change issues, and uh, poor outbreak response. So when you look at the Southeast Asian region, that's they are our neighbors. In 2022, India and Nepal reported uh, outbreaks. Again, the reporting is very poor. In 2023, the low level of transmission in Cox Bazaar in uh, Bangladesh. This Cox Bazaar is the area where the Rohingya uh, refugees are being located in Bangladesh. So in these photos, now uh, they are carrying out uh, vaccination from oral cholera vaccine. So now let's get into the local situation a bit. So no cases reported in Sri Lanka since 2003. The last case reported uh, in uh, January 2003. But due to the close proximity to endemic countries uh, like Bangladesh and India, Nepal, there's a possibility of uh, disease entering to Sri Lanka, so we cannot rule it out. But the possibility of outbreaks in Sri Lanka is less. So I'll explain uh, in later slides why I am saying so. When you look at the epidemiology, it's an acute diarrheal disease, extremely watery diarrhea. Uh, we generally call it as rice water stools. It's a potentially fatal dehydration unless treated uh, timely. And uh, transmission is basically uh, fecal, very rarely can spread from person to person. An incubation period, uh, two, to two hours to five days, but generally it takes as 24 to 48 hours. So most develop no or mild symptoms, less than 20% develop acute watery diarrhea. So outbreaks are mainly due to uh, ingestion of contaminated uh, water or food, then uh, massive outbreaks due to contamination of large water sources, then sporadic cases due to raw or undercooked uh, seafood. So outbreaks are uh, then cholera bacteria is easily killed by boiling water and uh, chlorination. So this is the global strategy put forward by WHO ending cholera by 2030 and they have came up with the target to reduce the cholera deaths by 90 percent and uh, the benchmark they have taken as 2017. Uh, now let's look at why cholera is uh, less likely in Sri Lanka. So I have divided into general and specific components. Uh, in general, the overall improvement of living standard in our country. So not only uh, this one, when you look at this graph, all the food and waterborne diseases in Sri Lanka is having a downward trend. So because uh, there are many reasons behind this, but um, for my, in my opinion, it's a majority due to overall improvement of living standards in the country. Then second, the higher literacy and uh, health literacy in our country. So the hand washing with soap and uh, water before eating and food preparation and after defecation and uh, safe disposal of children, children's feces and the drinking boil cool water or chlorinated or purified water. So this comes under high health literacy. So higher access to clean water, National Water Board, the Community Water Schemes, uh, well water, RO water, 
and the bottled water. So all these things are available in our country and improved uh, sanitary facilities. <coughs> Open defecation is very less in our country. And uh, the other factors like uh, good road network and good communication network all in all supports this fact. So World Bank uh, report says people practicing open defecation, percentage of population, if you look closely, uh, the left hand side uh, graph shows at 2018 it is almost zero, Sri Lanka figure, open defecation percentage. And uh, on the, but it's actually not zero, I'll tell you in the next slide. If you look at the other slide, this is the percentage of uh, uh, countries where open defecation is practiced. So if you look at carefully, this map is almost superimposed with the countries with cholera. So there's a very close association between the open defecation and uh, cholera. Now uh, I am like to draw your attention to uh, the DHS survey, Demographic and Health Survey 2016, done by Department of Census and Statistics. Uh, according to this one, it says the unimproved uh, facility of household, uh, basically they are talking about sanitary facilities. They are divided into improved facilities and unimproved facilities. So if you look at the total, the unimproved uh, amount is only 2.1 percent, meaning Sri Lanka have a improved toilet facility, so approximately 98 percent. So that is again a positive sign. And when you look at the household drinking water percentages from the same survey, DHS 2016, it says the uh, improved sources, it's around 90.2. In other words, 90.2 percent of Sri Lankan population have improved sources for drinking water, whereas unimproved uh, it's only 9.1. So these are the two uh, basic parameters where if cholera outbreak sets in, these th two things have to be uh, considered. So these are the specific things. So cholera is a group A notifiable disease. So if cholera is suspected, it's very, very important the treating physician should immediately take steps to inform over the phone uh, to the chief epidemiologist. So on suspicion, so they don't want to wait till the final diagnosis comes. So on suspicion, they should uh, inform the chief epidemiologist then and there. Then uh, we have a good uh, communicable disease surveillance system and uh, well-trained public health staff. Uh, then um, sound contact tracing mechanisms where we have proven that during COVID uh, outbreak. Then uh, network of laboratories and reference laboratories, availability of trained lab staff. So those are the positive things. Even if we come across a cholera case, so we can identify that is early and uh, we can confirm the diagnosis quickly. And uh, this is the water quality surveillance system available in Sri Lanka. So the water samples are analyzed in national and reference laboratories uh, in Sri Lanka. So the, the uh, NRL is, uh, is MRI. And uh, in addition to MRI, so we have uh, water quality testing labs in Vaunia, Anuradhapura, Kurunagala, Badulla, and Kaluthara. So the national norm is six samples from a single MOH area per month for bacteriology and two for chemical analysis. So if you take, uh, now currently we have 365 MOH areas in Sri Lanka. So if you multiply it by six uh, per month, 2,190 water samples are being tested around Sri Lanka. So there are some problems uh, due to reagents these days, but when it's practicing a normal phase, this is the amount. Finally, I want to uh, talk a bit about vaccines, though we are not practicing in our country. Currently, there are three WHO pre-qualified uh, oral cholera vaccines. So they are, they are Ducoral, uh, Shenacol, and uh, Evicol Plus. Uh, there are two doses. The gap between two doses are two weeks. And uh, they are used in uh, especially humanitarian crisis situations and during cholera outbreaks. And uh, they are very specifically say it always to be uh, going hand in hand with prevention and control measures. So it's not only the vaccine, it has to be a combined effort. So these are my references. Uh, thank you very much.
thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ruan Patirana, for your very informative and excellent presentation uh, on the subject. Um, in fact, what as he said, uh, mentioned, uh, we are very close to the cholera uh, endemic areas. In fact, uh, in 1816, the first pandemic started from Bengal. That is what I have heard. Um, then we come to the next presentation. It's on um, clinical presentation and management of cholera. Uh, it will be presented by Dr. Chamila Dalpadadu, uh, con consultant, uh, physician, and senior lecturer, Department of Physiology, Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. In fact, she is the uh, convener of the Expert Committee on Communicable Diseases of the SELA SLMA. Uh, so I kindly invite uh, Dr. Chamila Dalpatatu to present her uh, lecture. Thank you very much, sir. Good afternoon. I would like to thank uh, the Expert Committee on Communicable Diseases for inviting me to deliver this lecture. So um, as Dr. Tilanga said, uh, we are living in the seventh pandemic of cholera, although we sort of didn't realize it, and, uh, but it's ongoing. And uh, uh, knowing about cholera becomes important, especially, I believe, in a situation where several wars are going on and we are in a financial crisis situation. And um, although we have had good living, pract I mean, living standards, um, these things might affect the poorer community in case if it lands in our um, country again. So uh, it is a very old disease, but it still causes uh, deaths. So it's kind of alarming in this modern era for cholera to uh, cause so much of deaths worldwide, although we are lucky not to uh, experience it. So this is an old uh, drawing which shows how sick this woman is uh, simply because of dehydration. Right? And um, as the previous speaker said, this is the seventh cholera pandemic. And what is alarming for me was, although the previous six uh, cholera pandemics was over by at least two decades, this is still ongoing. So. Uh, we need to be somewhat vigilant and worry a little bit about this disease as well, among all the other problems. So um, I thought, why should we worry or why should we even talk about it? Um, so since of 2017, there is an upsurge of cases. And with this uh, uh, you know, modern era of traveling, all the travelers are at risk. And uh, our neighboring country has very high prevalence and uh, of acute watery diarrhea because they are probably the diagnosis of cholera itself is poor. And known or diagnosed outbreaks of uh, 1390 um, type or Bengal uh, variety outbreaks both in Bangladesh and India. And uh, the other th important thing is majority of patients will be asymptomatic. Only one in 10 develop severe symptoms. So it may go unnoticed as well, but they will spread the disease for two weeks um, once they have got it. And if we are not very vigilant about cholera, in case there is an outbreak, uh, the case weight, fatality rate will go up because if we are not vigilant in simply hydrating the patients, if we just take it as uh, acute gastroenteritis. 
and the natural infection and the currently available vaccines do not offer complete immunity. That is also one factor. As well as there are a lot of natural reservoirs uh, for the bacterium in warm coastal waters and uh, which makes actually eradication of this infection impossible. So the clinical features, we all know about these because we have studied. Um, and uh, very short incubation period because it, there's a preformed uh, toxin. And so two hours to five days, and it causes a secretory diarrhea. So there is presence of diarrhea even if the patient is fasting and profuse. Uh, uh, severe watery diarrhea. So classically described as rice water stools, and there could be vomiting, thirst, leg cramps, restlessness, and irritability. And uh, when these CNS symptoms occur, it's dangerous because that shows how bad the dehydration is. And they can become rapidly dehydrated, leading into circulatory collapse and renal failure and death. So this is why so many people are still dying in the world in this modern era of very advanced medicine. Although these poorer countries, once an, APD, uh, once an outbreak occurs, there are a lot of deaths. Because the health systems are not, cannot you know, manage the amount of patients who are presenting with dehydration. And especially poor outcomes is seen in patients with uh, achlorohydria. So where patients are on long-term uh, uh, proton pump inhibitors, acid suppression, and especially with patients with blood group O and chronic medical conditions. And mortality is obviously high in pregnant women and children. And immunocompromised individuals may experience prolonged sy symptoms as well. Um, I thought of talking a little bit about non cholera vibrio, or earlier known as that, but it's actually non O0, O1 serotype vibrio cholerae infections. And uh, these are actually uh, the, uh, the same symptoms can occur with a lot of soft tissue and skin disease as well. And um, uh, they can be associated with ingestion of raw or overcooked undercooked uh, shellfish, or uh, any traumatic exposure to sea or brackish water. And um, apart from diarrhea and vomiting, um, they can quickly go into septicemia and severe skin or soft tissue infections as well. So mostly uh, American continent and uh, in the Western countries, uh, there have been case reported cases reported, and uh, uh, although patients recover, they require uh, uh, intensive care uh, treatment. Uh, going uh, to the pathophysiology, so this is the classical pathophysiology lesson that we give to our physiology students as well. So since I'm from physiology, I thought it's very relevant um, that we know why this causes such a severe diarrhea. So uh, this is the epithelial cell of the small intestine. So Vibrio cholera is a flagellate organism and which has preformed cholera toxins. And uh, this, there are, it affects the ion channels. So cystic fibrosis transmembrane uh, conductors regulator is one of those channels. And uh, there is sodium hydrogen exchange so both these channels are affected by um, uh, cholera toxin. So what happens is uh, in the cholera uh, or vibrio cholera organism, there is uh, cholera toxin, which attach to this uh, GM1 receptors and activates the uh, adenylate cyclase and uh, again activates the intracellular cycling a AMP. So because of that, there is increased CMP, which stimulates this uh, CFTR and uh, inwardly uh, rectifying chloride channels, dependent chloride secretion. So there is an active secretion of chloride um, happening due to this toxin. And there's also inhibition of sodium absorption through uh, the inhibition of the sodium hydrogen exchanger thus causing a very profuse secretory diarrhea. 
So it's a preformed toxin affecting the ion channels in order to secrete ions. So readily water is also secreted. So it is, um, uh, this is the mechanism of profuse secretory diarrhea. But um, something good about the toxin, it does not affect the sodium glucose co-transport. So it affects the, it inhibits the sodium uh, chloride absorption and stimulate the chloride secretion, but it does not affect the sodium glucose co-transport. Because of that, oral rehydration therapy can be effectively used to tackle uh, uh, dehydration, and it can, it has been shown to reduce mortality by 50%. So this is the standard formula for oral rehydration solution. So uh, when I was like preparing for this, I was just wondering a few months back, I think there was a shortage of ORS in the country as well. So even to tackle normal diarrhea, I mean, we had to be, uh, you know, uh, this has to be available freely. So going further into the management, assessment of dehydration is of importance because uh, currently, I mean, people are very enthusiastic when a very, very complicated medical case is there in the ward, but simple gastroenteritis dehydration probably would go unnoticed. So assessment of the hypovolemia and uh, with simple clinical features and deciding whether it's severe or not. If it is severe as, uh, um, you know, uh, depicted by features of CNS involvement, like lethargy, inability to drink, and weak, uh, you know, general, uh, even being unconscious, you need to hydrate with IV fluids. But if the patient can take orally, e after each bout of uh, uh, bowel movements, you can give ORS, but otherwise needs IV uh, fluid replacement. Um, Hartman is preferred and um, it has to be started rapidly. So patients older than one year, um, probably 100 ml per kg in three hours, and uh, of course guided by um, the patient's general condition, urine output, and um, uh, signs of deterioration. So, uh, so this has to be uh, you know, carried out together with oral rehydration therapy. And uh, antibiotic therapy is there, and it is recommended for patients with moderate to severe dehydration as an adjunct to rehydration therapy. And, uh, but the antibiotics have not been shown to decrease the secondary transmission of cholera within a household. So practicing all the uh, san good sanitary methods are still important. And uh, children less than 12 years and uh, more than 12 years, probably the doxycycline will be the drug of choice. And alternate drugs will be acetromycin and ciprofloxacin. So uh, this is effective given orally for patients who can tolerate orally, but other drugs can be also used um, and uh, uh, in a uh, severe, uh, if the patient is severely septic. So uh, basically rehydration and antibiotics, if necessary, will be the management. So doxycycline is recommended as first-line treatment for adults, including pregnant women and children. And um, if it is resistant, uh, acetromycin and ciprofloxacin. So most importantly, the normal feeding can be resumed once vomiting has stopped because uh, there had been case reported with severe hypoglycemia with ongoing cholera or diarrhea because a lot of people would stop eating thinking that their diarrhea would stop, but uh, the oral feeding can be resumed. So uh, probably one um, important thing to remember would be the catabolic effect of infection is relatively low. They don't become, um, you know, severely anorexic. Uh, the intestinal enzyme activity remains normal. So uh, the absorption of nutrient via intestinal or enteral way is still possible while managing a cholera patient. So, um, the, another aspect of antibiotic therapy is the importance of studying the sensitivity patterns as in any infection. 
So for example, in India, the re-emerged Vibrio cholera O139 in 2000 displayed a difference in, in compared to what happened early on between 1992 to 1993. And uh, the, those strains were sensitive to cotrim, but resistant to nalidisic as in, and uh, furosilidion. And uh, so this type of resistant patterns can emerge with ongoing pandemic. And uh, we need to be aware of these things. And uh, uh, But all strains of Vibrio cholera were uniformly susceptible to chloramphenicol, uh, tricycline, amikacin, and norfloxacin. So um, severe cases could be managed with these uh, broad spectrum antibiotics. Uh, so the molecular studies revealed different clones of uh, Vibrio cholera uh, prevailing in the country with, uh, I mean, India, with, uh, with this re-emergence of Vibrio cholera and uh, with a different clonality in Delhi. So uh, these things play a vital role when, uh, you know, managing cholera pandemic in this um, era. Uh, a bit about future emerging therapeutic targets, if we go back to the pathophysiology, uh, there are several sites which we can target for new therapy. So one is uh, this motility of the organism depending on the flagellum, so that is a uh, target, and the uh, cholera toxin product as well as uh, cholera toxin itself and the entry point of GM1 receptors and CFTR uh, channel activation, which can be uh, uh, suppressed as well as the adenylate cyclase enzyme. So the CMP generating enzyme adenylate cyclase, AC6, is associated with the one uh, which is stimulating the CFTR. So if we can block AC6, it can impair the cholera toxin induced CFTR activation, thus the secretory component of the diarrhea. And it could be used as an anti specific antidiarrheal agent in cholera. These are still under study. And uh, some bactericidal, uh, sorry, sub-bactericidal concentration of anethol, it's a component in the sweet fennel seed, uh, could suppress the virulence potential in the O1 or uh, l uh, biotype strains in toxigenic Vibrio cholera. So that is also under study. And also inhibition of the cholera toxin binding to GM1 receptors, uh, uh, which, and the intracellular processing of the cholera toxin, uh, it's a, a potentially a prophylactic therapeutic approach for cholera as well. Uh, and uh, worst study is another component being studied, which inhibits the bacterial virulence through suppression of uh, expression of uh, cholera toxin and toxin uh, uh, corrugated pillars. And methanol in, uh, extracted from the red chili containing capsaicin inhibit the cholera toxin expression uh, as well. So this flagellar motility um, uh, may regulate uh, expression of cholera virulence factor. So uh, anti-motility, uh, uh, so if we can inhibit the motility of this organism, that could be a, of a potential target uh, for um, cholera uh, therapy. So these are still under study. I mean, it all depends of the importance of cholera to the world. And in an ongoing epidemic, uh, uh, pandemic rather, uh, if uh, it becomes a global threat, of course, these therapeutic agents will be developed uh, further, I suppose. So complications of cholera, I suppose the acute ones which we are familiar with, um, acute um, renal failure, electrolyte imbalances, and complications of this, septicemia and cerebritis even. Um, so all these uh, non o uh, one uh, Vibrio cholera species has, has been implicated in these septicemia and these soft tissue infections. And the long term, uh, they have studied in Japan um, early infancy exposure to cholera pandemic had stunted effects on the uh, final height of men in Japan, uh, according to one study. So in summary, uh, although cholera is a very old disease, it has a still a very significant mortality rate. 
So with the upsurge of global cholera, um, uh, it becomes important that we keep ourselves up to date. And um, ORS and antibiotics are proven effective in saving lives. And uh, novel specific therapies are needed to fill gaps in the management. And future, of course, will be research regarding emerging therapeutic targets. So these were the references. And thank you very much for listening. Uh, zinc has a very uh, important place in management in the acute diarrhea, as madam, because uh, it is needed for epithelial regrowth as well as um, probiotics. In the uh, even after a very severe episode of diarrhea, uh, the uh, microbiome changes in our gut, so it is important to get the balance. So probiotic probably has a place in that sense in any uh, infectious diarrhea. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tamila, for your very informative uh, uh, lecture. So uh, just to tell you one thing, now uh, the, the present seventh pandemic, uh, cholera pandemic, started in 1961, and it reached Africa in 1971, in again in other countries in 1991, and still going on. And um, uh, the cholera uh, was caused by uh, uh, the Vibrio cholerae, and Vibrio cholerae has uh, uh, 139 zero groups. And earlier, it was thought that only O1 will cause uh, the cholera. Uh, the disease. But later on, in 1992, uh, they found that even uh, O131, uh, 139 will cause cholera. That was found in Bangladesh in 1992. This is just to tell you something about this. Uh, again, uh, if you talk about cholera, uh, when we were schooling, uh, we ha we I still can I still can remember that there were uh, we uh, the Sri Lanka had a problem uh, from uh, the getting cholera from India through uh, uh, some refugees really uh, or refugees or people who are coming from, sorry, people who are coming from India to Sri Lanka to especially to the northern area. Uh, we used to call them those days kalatoni. I don't know whether it's a good word or not. That is how we were talk. Uh, the people we were talking about them, and um, the Sri Lanka had a problem uh, through them getting cholera from India. Uh, later on, uh, many people from Sri Lanka went to India on pilgrimage. And there was another threat uh, to Sri Lanka uh, getting cholera from India through these uh, the people who are going on pilgrimage. Uh, those are few things I just wanted to mention here. Uh, the last or the third presentation is on clinical diag uh, sorry uh, um, laboratory diagnosis and the preventive measures uh, that will be done by dr sujata patirage the consultant clinical uh, microbiologist who is the head of the food and water microbiology department of the uh, medical research institute colombo and uh, i kindly invite her to uh, present a uh, lecture here.
Thank you, sir, for kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I uh, thank uh, committee, uh, committee Covered Disease Subcommittee of SLMA for inviting me for this lecture. Uh, I'll be talking uh, on cholera diagnosis and a little bit on control. Uh, Yes, I think history we have heard now. So, uh, in microbiology, for the cholera, it is a curved gram-negative bacillus, which is motile, and uh, cholera has uh, somatic, or the, it is a polysaccharide cell wall of uh, the bacteria, and the flagella antigen, which is for the motility. So, Based on this O group, so the somatic antigen, we divide this cholera into different zero groups. Uh, among the cholerae, uh, the vibrio cholerae is, uh, uh, among the vibrios, vibrio cholerae is uh, uh, non halophilic That means it doesn't need uh, very much of sodium chloride to live on. But this is some one of the features we used in the laboratory for identification of uh, vibrios. And it is just like other enterobacteria can grow on normal ordinary media. But uh, with this uh, lot of, uh, we have so many uh, gastroenteritis causing pathogens which all belong, mainly belong to enterobacteria group. Uh, because of that, uh, the vibrio identification from this media, this media is is difficult. Because of that, we are using special media for uh, vibrio. And uh, like in any other enterobacteria or the most of the gastroenteritis causing pathogens, which uh, this can uh, the vibrios can grow on. Uh, all this temperature from 30, 37, and 42, which are the common incubation temperatures we used in the laboratory. Yeah. And uh, it does, it can't tolerate acid pH, and it prefers the alkaline pH. Again, uh, not the feature which you used in the laboratory. So Vibrio cholerae, uh, as mentioned earlier, now, uh, yeah. Uh, we have we divide into vibrio cholerae and non vibrio, non vibrio uh, cholerae. So vibrio cholerae, uh, which belongs to vibrio cholerae O1 and O139 and non O1, non O139, uh, because now. So this is. Uh, yeah, Vibrio non O1, uh, the O1 is, and O139 are very uh, known to cause vibri uh, the cholerae, uh, but non O1, non O139, Vibrio also uh, is reported to cause uh, diarrheal uh, episodes or outbreaks, but not into the extent of this uh, pandemic or uh, epidemic situations. In addition, there are other vibrios other than vibrio cholerae. Those are the, as earlier mentioned, vibrio parahemolyticus, vibrio vulnificus, which we have seen a uh, few cases here uh, uh, occasionally with septicemia. Then uh, this Vibrio cholerae is uh, like uh, subdivided into different serotypes and biotypes, uh, which uh, again is uh, important in uh, identification, but in routine diagnostic level, we may not need to know. But these biotypes, the classical and ELTO, each uh, is uh, clearly identified in different uh, the, the, these pandemics. Uh, of course, ELTO is mainly uh, restricted to Asian region. Uh, classical is the one which has caused main pandemics. Depending on the different uh, O antigens, these Inaba, Ogawa, and Hikojima, these are the other serotypes other than main O12, O139 serotypes.
So now labo when we talk about the laboratory diagnosis, in a situation where there are like a lot of cases or there are outbreaks, uh, it is uh, not necessary to confirm uh, case, each and every case by laboratory diagnosis. But in countries like ours, it is important to uh, diagnose cases and if there is any suspicion, uh, we should do the laboratory diagnosis. Now, clinical presentations, as earlier mentioned, the asymptomatic uh, uh, cases are the uh, common presentation, but then there can be mild to moderate diarrheal illness. Uh, it cannot be distinguishable from other causes of gastroenteritis. And then typical watery diarrhea with rice water stool, like profuse watery, colorless stool with uh, flakes of mucus with some fish order. Uh, so depending on these presentations, uh, the laboratory diagnosis, uh, we have to like uh, be very careful because it, in a typical case, uh, we can go with normal uh, culture of the stool. Like if we get a rice water stool, that stool sample itself will function as the enrichment broth. So, we may directly plate on a culture plate, but in asymptomatic cases, it will be mainly uh, the semi-solid or uh, stool won't be having much uh, uh, the liquid. So it is important to enrich these, uh, the first two samples from first two clinical presentations. It is important to enrich the sample. So ideal sample would be, uh, if it is watery stool sample, uh, which should be collected within uh, earliest possible time before starting on antibiotic. For any microbiological investigations, it is uh, the, we have to collect the sample before starting on antibiotics. Uh, then, uh, if not the uh, stool sample, we can collect a rectal swab. Uh, so again, it could be, it is a good sample for acute uh, patient who is in acute illness, acute phase of the illness, but in the convalescent phase or the asymptomatic patients, uh, it won't be a very good sample. Uh, in addition to these two, even the filter papers can be used as sample, uh, transport, uh, for, for transport of these samples where when a liquid uh, water stool sample is there, you can put a filter paper into the sample and then uh, carefully put on a transport, uh, the uh, uh, laboratory the sample specimen container and uh, transport into the laboratory. Now, this, uh, the advantage is now, if you are using a, a sample, water sample itself, it can be just straight away sent, but in addition to the sample itself, it is possible to use a transport, transport medium like uh, alkaline peptone water. Or else, the Clarivea media is the commonest transport medium and it is the best medium uh, for transport of uh, uh, suspect uh, stool sample from suspected patients who are having uh, suspected to have cholera because the pH of the medium is 8.4 which is alkaline and then it supports uh, the it supports the maintaining of viability of vibrio cholerae and in the clary blair medium even up to 4 weeks we uh, the cholera vibrio cholerae will survive when it comes to the filter paper uh, as a transport mode, even for about five weeks, this Vibrio will survive on the uh, filter paper. Then there was a uh, Venkataram and Ramakrishna media, which was known to like uh, uh, in earlier period, we were like uh, known to have, we, we uh, had like, we were, taught on this medium, but of course, currently, which is not being used. 
so we are using uh, special media for the uh, vibrio cholerae, not like for other enteric pathogens. It is the TCBS uh, medium, uh, which is uh, when we receive the sample, uh, we directly plate on the uh, TCBS medium and incubate the sample. Uh, but uh, foamed stool or uh, stool uh, uh, stool from asymptomatic individual, it is better to uh, inoculate on alkaline peptone water. So as a routine in the laboratory, we used alkaline peptone water enrichment step for all the samples uh, while we uh, in, uh, inoculating onto the TCBS medium, we do the enrichment because within about four to six hours, four to uh, like six to eight hours, alkaline peptone water medium will give a uh, uh, will support rapid multiplication of vibrio cholerae, and from there we can again within six a six to eight hours we can subculture onto the TCBS medium. So this is TCBS or the thiosulfate citrate bile sucrose ega, which is the like which is well known medium used in the laboratory. But of course now, as uh, we have the last case in 2003, uh, still we have the facilities to do vibrio uh, identification. Uh, actually now, not only clinical cases, we are doing uh, food sample testing for vibrio. Because of that, we have the we are maintaining the facility even for subtyping uh, facility is uh, available in the laboratory. So when we, uh, uh, we uh, when we have the like uh, typical colonies on TCBS medium that is uh, the where sugar is used as the fermenting uh, the uh, carbohydrate and which will show us a typical yellow color colonies. And presumptively we do some other biochemical test, oxidase uh, test, and which is when it is positive, we have a crude test in the laboratory where we do the string test, uh, which is like uh, we have a, we make the, um, uh, on a gra glass microscopic slide, we make suspension of this, uh, uh, colony on uh, in a drop of 0.5 percent aqueous solution of sodium deoxycholate and this is uh, when we are just uh, making the suspension and when you raise the wire loop we can see a small string so this is one of a crude test which is being used in the laboratory which confirm that it is a vibrio cholerae uh, then we can further confirmation we have polyvalent uh, uh, o antisera and that again a slight deagglutination test and uh, then we can use other uh, biochemical series of biochemical tests to further identify uh, uh, vibrio cholerae. So these are the some of the biochemical tests uh, to identify this uh, uh, differentiate this classical biotype and L2. And Inaba, Ogawa, and Hikojima, these are only slight agglutination. We have antisera uh, to identify these uh, serotypes. So once uh, these are the co common routine laboratory method of identification, in addition, there are standard uh, biochemical identification kits available, like uh, 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 for any, like most of these organisms can be now identified using these biochemical kits or uh, there are like um, new identific automated identification systems, uh, but uh, the, for these pathogens it's like uh, the, 
uh, we can't go by one of the, the only by one of these automated methods other than the Molditoff. There is another uh, automated system which is coming up. Uh, it is there actually, and it is uh, uh, it can be used for identification. In addition, there are molecular identification system by PCR. Uh, uh, in addition, the rapid diagnostic method uh, are being used in most of the countries with outbreaks. Stool dipstick test, which is uh, which is one of a uh, like it can be used in the field, uh, especially in outbreak situation. Uh, this is very helpful and it is uh, uh, being used, but the problem with this uh, stool dipstick test is uh, that it is um, not uh, very sensitive. So once you do the testing and then you have to confirm with uh, stand, uh, go standard methods. So when it comes to uh, prevention and control, uh, I think uh, mainly Dr. Tilanga has already discussed most of the areas. Uh, now, it is mainly safe water, not only safe water, there should be adequate supply of water uh, to uh, maintain the hygiene as well as uh, while having a safe water for drinking. Uh, so, in Sri Lanka, uh, yeah, I'll come back. I'll come to that. Then safe food is another major because now it is uh, cholera is not uh, uh, it is not uh, transmitted from human to human as such. It is a, a mainly food and waterborne disease. So it is important to have safe food. Safe food in the sense now it is um, uh, water is main mode of transmission. In addition, uh, sea food like shell. Uh, Fish, shellfish are also uh, carrying the organism uh, vibrio in their uh, shells. So uh, it is important to monitor uh, shellfish for carrying vibrio. In addition, the vibrio can, uh, vibrio cholera can contaminate uh, vegetables, fruits. Uh, so it is important to have uh, maintain the food safe food for consumption. Once uh, the cases are detected, infection control at healthcare facilities is important. Uh, then vaccination. Vaccination, of course, like uh, it is not mandatory. Uh, it is not like Sri Lanka does not recommend. And vaccination is uh, actually recommended uh, only even for the uh, travelers to endemic countries are not recommended to get vaccination. Uh, some countries recommend uh, vaccination for especially immunocompromised patient, pe people who are traveling to those endemic countries. So chlorination of water, boiling of water, uh, and water quality monitoring, and as Dr. Tilang uh, mentioned before, we have a very good system of water quality monitoring, uh, and it is a multidisciplinary uh, approach with uh, various uh, sectors are involving it. And uh, we have uh, then uh, chlorination of water is well maintained. Then the bottled water industry is regulated and all the bottled water industry um, uh, need to regularly get uh, uh, registered after testing their uh, water source to the product. And uh, then we have the uh, monitoring of uh, import. We have, though we have the sea around the country, we do, the, uh, we do import fish. So fish is uh, sent for testing at food laboratories, uh, but for the like, uh, I haven't seen a single Vibrio cholerae isolated from uh, any form of fish. Even I inquired from the uh, NARA, which is um, the laboratory which is certifying export uh, product of fish. They haven't encountered uh, Vibrio, Vibrio cholerae. 
and uh, of course we do encounter other vibrio species but not the cholerae. So cholera vaccination as I mentioned, uh, there are two oral, uh, or oral cholera vaccination but Sri Lanka uh, we don't recommend. Yeah, it is only used in areas with endemic cholera, especially vaccine in areas endemic cholera with uh, like uh, targeting cholera uh, hotspots. Then infection control at healthcare setting, I didn't go into detail of this, but uh, we have had a very good experience re in the recent past with the COVID. Uh, so uh, we need like uh, isolation, court isolation or single isolation of patients, then all the infection control activity should be strengthened. We may have to have a cholera treatment unit, then the appropriate hand hygiene facilities like uh, ideally soap and water, and if not, alcohol hand rub also can be used, and appropriate PPE, uh, especially because patients are having uh, vomiting and profuse diarrhea. So it is very important to have appropriate uh, personal protective equipment uh, to avoid uh, patient secretions coming into contact with other people. Uh, then it, environmental cleaning in a case where there are patients, it's very important then wastewater, uh, wastewater from the such treatment units should be collected into one place rather than putting into other uh, storage systems and uh, treat them before putting into uh, the uh, normal storage system. Then other than that, food preparation and handling as for any other foodborne disease, it is very important to uh, practice uh, food uh, uh, like uh, hand hygiene, uh, separation of uh, raw food and uh, un the uncooked food and the cooked food, and then use uh, separate uh, uh, separate uh, chopping boards uh, and keeping at proper temperature, uh, cooling. Rather, we should not keep exposed to the other flies and. Uh, Getting, uh, avoid getting contaminated. So it is very important to uh, adhere to uh, food safety measures even at home in a uh, situation like uh, known outbreak. But uh, these are the uh, infection control. I didn't go into detail, but of course there are a lot of uh, detail when it comes to coral outbreak. Uh, but still the basic infection control practices are uh, important to be adhered to. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sujata Patridi. So now we have come to the end of the, uh, the symposium. The last part is the discussion. I kindly invite all the three speakers to come to the uh, stage uh, for the discussion. And I, am, I wish to invite Dr. Lucian Jayasuriya, a past president of the SLMA and a very uh, a senior member of the expert committee on communicable diseases to chair the discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, 
I thank the chair of the ECCD of the SLMA for asking me to chair this meeting. The, the discussion, <coughs> we have had a very good, three good presentations by three eminent speakers, and uh, they were very clear in what they were say, saying. So now we we'll, uh, open the forum for the, any discussion, any questions. I want to ask Shamila why this serum uh, more positives are more, more, more prone to infection. Um, sorry, sir, I, I really don't know. Probably needs more reading. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Any questions for the audience from the uh, from Zoom? There's a question on Zoom that ORS is not available even now. What is the reason? Probably imported, I think, but the other, the packeted one is uh, SPC, right? So. so you might have to write to the SPC or at least take it up with them, asking why, as a, our committee, should ask why they are not having it. Maybe they are not selling so much, but still they can have a, some type of supply, no? No, it, it, I mean that maybe that is one of the one of the one responsibility of the species to make sure that the drugs are available. <coughs> okay, then thank you very much. And uh, we have the presentation of certificates to the speakers by the chair of our committee. Thank you very much. So I wish to thank everyone who have joined uh, online as well as who are present here for participating in this uh, symposium. Thank you.